Good morning, Park Hill Church family. Good morning. Would you please stand with us if you are willing and able? As we begin, let um, us collectively remember that it is God that calls us to himself. It's an invitation from him to be with him, to be in his presence. And so God, we pause, we slow down, we remember this invitation from you. Spirit, would you give us ears to hear it this morning? To resist the familiarity that brings us into autopilot in our flesh. Spirit, would you wake us up? Would you help us hear this call, this invitation to come to be with you? Sing this. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God let your fire fall down. Let's sing it again. Are open, nothing here. 
Jesus, the name above. 
Jesus, we remember our need and our dependence on you this morning, that there would be no way to the Father apart from you, there would be no access to the Spirit, the source of all power, all goodness, all comfort, all truth. Jesus, we worship you. Because you have been so generous and because you have loved us so perfectly. God, we are able to love you back and we are able to hold our hands open and loosely with all the things that you have given to us. 
what a privilege and what a joy. So out of gratitude, God, we move into this next expression of worship. joy to be able to be generous as you've been generous with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, Park Hill. Welcome this morning. Uh, we're so glad to be here with you today. We're going to move into, continue in our worship, um, moving into our giving liturgy, our generosity liturgy. You will be able to give either in the bowls on the communion tables, or you can give digitally. But right now we're going to uh, pray this prayer of worship and generosity. Um, so if you can, join with me in, in reading. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given me. All that I have and am belong to you. I bought with the blood of Jesus to spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice. Generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds, who stand the illusion of riches and chose the word, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a movement as one. Trust me with true riches. And above all, I'm determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. Amen. So now we are going to take a few moments and be generous with our time with one another. So we'll be back in three minutes. Please take this time to learn somebody's name, get to know someone, share coffee. All right, we'll be back. See you soon.
Good morning. So good to see you guys. If you can make your way back to your seats, we'll get started in just a minute. Hopefully you got a cup of coffee. We're able to meet someone new, hug someone old. Good morning, Park Hill. Let's just start for just a second. Psalm 33, here we go. We're gonna keep the praise going. Psalm 33, sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He's faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Beautiful. Father, we just thank you. We acknowledge how great you are. However, we're coming into this morning, whether it's with praise or with lament or with struggle, we lay it at your feet and we're here in this moment expectant for your spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Park Hill. How are you? Good. I'm Aaliyah. If we haven't met um, one of the pastors here, it's nice to see you guys. Um, if you have been here any length of time, you know that there are three things that we're about. We want to be people who are with Jesus, just daily, weekly, hour by hour, who are with him. We want to be with Jesus, and we want that to help us become like Jesus so that we can do what he did. And there's a lot of ways that takes shape in our church. We hope that everything flows from these th three things to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what he did. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by practices. We want to be people who are not, um, not just formed by the world. We want to be formed by practices that we see throughout scripture. We want to be people who are in the word, who are praying, who are fasting, who are doing all these things, and we want to do it together in community. So today we actually have a story. I'm going to bring up Shoop. Yeah, Nate Shoop. Uh, he, his community has been practicing some things. Shoop, you want to tell us about it? Yeah. So like Aaliyah said, fasting, one of the practices, um, we're going through practicing the way in our community. And as we came, came upon fasting, um, one of the parts in the fasting practice is giving of your funds to the, to the needy. Uh, so what we did is when connection kind of met conviction, um, we had a connection within our community group, but also a couple of our good friends at Point Loma to a Haitian refugee center in City Heights. And we, as a community group, fasted together and we pooled our money together and we actually were able to purchase them a freezer so that they could store food in their uh, community center. Um, so, so, yeah, this is a huge praise. Um, it was, really, it was really cool to see how God was able to connect so many people and for his name to be exalted. So, yeah. Thank you. Guys, thank you. Thanks. Beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's such a blessing to actually hear how the Spirit is shaping um, us as a body. Not just to do these practices. I know that, especially through fasting um, in communities, it was like, why, why are we doing this? Why does God ask us to not eat and pray? Um, for lengths of time, and just hearing the way that this community was moved towards generosity and to actually seeing people um, who struggle to have food, that's it. Like, we want to be people who become like Jesus and then go out and do what he did. So that's why we say this week in and week out. We want to be with Jesus so that we actually get our perspective from him and then become like him and do what he did. So thanks for sharing, you guys. It's beautiful. Um, Another way we wanna do this is um, by serving here in these walls. We wanna take it to City Heights. We wanna be in, out in San Diego. We also want to serve here in the walls of Park Hill. A need we have coming up is um, kids ministry, hanging out with the kiddos. We believe that kids are not the future of the church, but they are now. They are functioning and vital parts of our body um, and we need to serve them. So in the summer, all you wonderful college kids who serve all year go home and that's great, we miss you. Um, but we end up being short staffed over in kids ministry. So generally the commitment is once a month for one service. So if you would consider, if you're here for the summer, signing up to serve for the summer in kids ministry, it would be a huge blessing um, to this body, to the kids, to parents, and to you because this is it. Jesus asked us to serve one another. 
Um, also with that, with kids being central to the heart of what we believe Park Hill is called to, Evan's got an incredible announcement for us today about RFK. Thanks, Leah. It is incredible. It's also real, very real announcement. Okay, every year, how many of you guys have done RFK, either given to Royal Family Kids Camp or you've served at Royal Family Kids Camp? A lot of you. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, in order to make this camp possible, we run a fundraising campaign. We don't do many of these. We just call the whole church to give to the church normally. Every Sunday, we call the church to give. But once a year, we call the church to give over and above your normal church giving for the sake of these kids. These are some of the most vulnerable kids in our county, most vulnerable humans in all of San Diego County. And we have the privilege of bringing, we wanna bring 45 or more this year uh, to Royal Family Kids Camp and give them the time of their lives. It is more than just a corrective experience for many of these kids who've suffered abuse. Uh, it's, it, is a, it is a spiritual experience that they look forward to year in and year out. And many of the kids immediately signed up again when we said this year we're doing it again. We already have way over 20, I think, kids signed up ready to go. But it costs about $1,500 per kid to send them to this camp, which means our target is 60 grand. And we're calling this church and other churches to give, but you guys have given so generously in the past. However, we are only at five grand right now. So we are calling all of us to consider giving so that 45 kids plus can experience the presence of God through the love of the church from really difficult spaces in this really holy place. So uh, please consider giving over and above your normal church giving if you can give 1,500, amazing. If you're in a place where you can take, support 10 kids, give 15 grand, amazing. We're calling you to support these kids in this moment of healing in their lives and, and deep love. So uh, is that clear? We wanna, we wanna, there it is. You can snap a shot of that QR code and just kind of browse the giving options and really pray. What is God calling you to give over and above your normal generous worship as a local church giver. So there you go, that is the call, sound good? Let's, let's bring these kids to Jesus. So um, with that, we're gonna get into the teaching. I'd like to invite Wheeler Fisher to come up, there she is, and read Acts chapter six. Let me open it up for you, sorry. Face ID, there we go. <laughs> My face will not work. Good morning. If you're able, please stand for the reading of the word. This is Acts 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Wheeler. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I didn't introduce myself before. My name is Evan Wickham. If you're new or visiting, hello. Welcome to Park Hill Church. My wife Sandy and I have the honor of leading this church with a team that feels like family, so welcome. Um, we are walking through the book of Acts through 2024, and today we get to explore the life of one of the most fascinating and inspiring to me, inspiring to me, individuals in the entire Bible, okay? I absolutely love when I get to talk about this guy. I'm so struck by the life of this person. His name is Stephen. And he's one of the seven Greek-speaking Jewish Christians we saw last week. If you're here last week, 
uh, he was one of the men chosen, uh, one, of the, one of a marginalized group within the church, this minority group. He was chosen from within this group to serve the whole church. Uh, and now Luke, the author of Acts, this guy Luke, he now zooms in on the life of Stephen for two whole chapters. So this guy gets two chapters of real estate in the book of Acts. And so I think this might be the first sermon I ever preached when we were pre-launching Park Hill in the winter of 2017, about February. I gave a teaching on Stephen's life um, before Park Hill was even had a, had a name. And uh, then I've referred back to Stephen's life for a few New Year's Eve sermons since then because there's just something about him that screams like new life, new year, fresh vision, total potential for the kingdom and for influencing people for God's love. So uh, today we're gonna, the Holy Spirit has us looking at Stephen again. There's so much goodness here, okay? So who is Stephen? He's a typical person in many ways, unassuming, not one of the apostles. Again, he's one of the first deacons, not one of the apostles, but he went on to live this extraordinary life and Luke dedicates 10% of his book to Stephen. So we're not gonna walk through all of the two chapters, that's a lot of chapters. Uh, chapter seven is Stephen's whole sermon. Stephen actually preaches a sermon while he's on trial for his life. And it's all of chapter seven, basically. And we're not gonna walk through it, read it at home this week for sure. Instead, I'm gonna sum up the main points of Stephen's life and this sermon as we explore what this, how, what this matters for us today. So if you were to sit me down today and say, Evan, what are three things? Three things you want for Park Hill Church. Like we were at coffee, and you're like, what are three dreams you have for Park Hill? Uh, so by the time we hit Christmas Eve this year, our church will be seven years old. That feels significant. So uh, if you're like, what three things do you, as, as, as a leader in this church, hope marks the lives of every person in Park Hill? I'd probably just open to Act 6, and I'd take you to the life of Stephen. So, but, but first in context, here's a slide we've used to show you the whole book of Acts. So we're at the end of that second chunk. We're gonna finish chapter seven today, which is Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit's poured out, miracles are happening, a new church is forming. People are financially generous. They're sending all their kids to RFK. Everyone's giving all kinds of money to the church. And so, so there's all kinds of generosity and, and new leaders are happening. But in Acts six, we saw a problem last week, didn't we? Ethnic cultural tensions were emerging in the church, people being excluded on the basis of group identity. That was happening last week. Because the reality of life in church is it's messy. It's messy everywhere. Life, human life, humans are imperfect beings. And so uh, there's this tension between the Greek-speaking Christians and the Aramaic-speaking Christians. They start to faction off. And so they pick one of the non-dominant group, the Greek-speaking Jews, and he's Stephen. They pick one of these guys, Stephen, and they raise him up from the marginalized minority and becomes this extraordinary influencer. Uh, so we don't know much about him. He's a normal guy living his life and he finds himself suddenly thrust into the spotlight here. This is why I love this passage. Stephen's not some full-time preacher or apostle. You can't hold him up and say, well, obviously Stephen, he's one of the founders. He's one of the guys who walked with Jesus. No, he didn't. Why is this important? Because Stephen is who the Holy Spirit has in mind for like the normal church person, not a full-time pastor, and he's living, he's, he has a commute to work. He's like you. He lives and works and commutes all while being full of the power of the Spirit used in phenomenal ways to bring in the kingdom of God. So my desire for our church today, I would love for every single one of you to leave this building today thinking, oh, Stephen did that? I could do that. I could totally do this. So, so for the rest of our time, three things. We're just gonna look at three things and that'll be the meat of our time. So here's the first from Stephen's life. Number one, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We cannot miss this. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So my first prayer for this church for the rest of 2024, you would resolve in your heart, I'm just gonna grow in understanding who the Holy Spirit is. He's not scary. He's the best possible person who can intimately know you and you know. And I'm just gonna grow in understanding who the Holy Spirit is and what he's capable of doing through my life. 
So can we resolve in our hearts as we prepare for our seventh birthday now? I don't know why I look at our church years like this, but seven years, it feels like a moment of completion, you know? And, and this year, I'm going to complete, I'm going to upgrade my understanding of what it means uh, for the Holy Spirit to flood my life. And so this is his number one cr credential. Here it is, verse 5. The proposal pleased the group, and they chose Stephen. What was his credential? Full of faith in the Spirit top of his resume. They weren't like, oh, he's an exceptional citizen. Or like, he's made a bunch of wise business moves. He started, he's an entrepreneur. That was not his thing. Um, he had no portfolio references from his networks. He's just a normal person elected to serve the church as a leader because he's marked by the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in his life. And then again in verse eight. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. That's the presence of the Spirit, signs and wonders. And then verse 10 again, they could not resist the wisdom with which he spoke. So the Jewish leaders that were confronting Stephen, they couldn't resist his wisdom because of the presence of the person of God in his life. Normal person, Holy Spirit comes on him, extraordinary power. So how do we know we're marked by the Holy Spirit? How do you know? When you see someone full of the Spirit, what are, you, what are you looking at? Just think of the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's self-sacrificial love, joy. They're joyful. <laughs> They're peace and there's patience. It's someone whose default setting isn't sarcasm, but kindness. Goodness. They're faithful. They're reliable. They're trustworthy. They have self-control, right? So question, when you think about your own life, how much of that is present in your life? And then another question, if these things are not present in your life, then knowing that the Holy Spirit is a promise from the Father, ask ourselves, why isn't this happening in my life? And knowing the Holy Spirit is a gift, you can't earn the presence of the Spirit. The presence of the Spirit is a gift. Knowing that the Spirit is a gift, then ask, myself, ask yourself, how can I posture myself this year in order to receive more of the gift? More of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. So the Spirit is this gift from a loving Father who takes normal people, turns them into someone like Stephen. This is what marked his life. So let me say this in light of what I've said. You are not destined to just grind out another 30 or 40 years and then that's it. That is not your destiny. It's not just you with the same habits. You look into the future like, I'm just going to have the same tendencies and same frustrating patterns, and then I'll just go to heaven when I die and finally be made perfect. No, God offers you the Holy Spirit to change you, to influence everything about you. The Holy Spirit can take a normal human life like you and me, and he can fill us with himself, and remarkable transformation can happen. This is why our whole church vision boils down to being with Jesus becoming like him, changing, and doing what he did, because change is possible. One of my favorite illustrations of this, I brought this up many times over the last six years. It's this book that really marked me. It's not even a Christian book. And it's called Living with a Seal. It was like New York and LA Times bestseller. I don't know if you read it. The story about Jesse Itzler, this New York entrepreneur guy. Uh, in long story short, Jesse Itzler, he, he's the guy who started Zico Coconut Water with, with his buddy Matt Damon. He's like this famous guy. Uh, so Jesse started Coconut Water when Coconut Water was not a thing. And, uh, and he, so he's this, this outside-the-box thinker, and he's running this ultra marathon, and he sees this Navy SEAL running the marathon with him all by himself. Jesse had a relay team. This Navy SEAL had himself. No relay team for like 120 miles. And it was actually happening in the San Diego Zoo parking lot. They're just running laps for two days. Not led by the Spirit. That sounds like a bad time. <laughs> that is not Holy Spirit led. But, but Jesse was doing this. He's like, who is that guy? Turns out he's, he's David Goggins, this hardened Navy SEAL, just amazing. And um, Jesse's like, David, I just want you to live in my house and train me 24 seven for like 30 days straight to be like you. <laughs> I just want to be you. 
And so, so you read the book, it's wild. Like the seal makes Jesse do crazy stuff like, you know, uh, multiple 10 mile runs a day, sub-zero blizzard runs and spending whole nights sleeping in a hard chair, impromptu cold plunges in frozen lakes, just on a whim. Uh, great book, very fun. Horrible things I would never do. And at, at the end of his experience, so at the end of his experience, this is what Jesse says. He's like, the SEAL, this Navy SEAL taught me when you're absolutely physically done and you've hit the wall, you are actually at 40% of your physical capacity. You have 60% left. You have no idea what you're capable of. You have no idea what a human being potential is. And so by the end of the 30 days, Jesse's doing uh, 1,000 push-ups a day, 100 chin-ups a day, running ultra marathons, two minutes less mile pace than he ever did. Incredible book. So it made me think, I wonder what it would be like if I had someone live with me to train me. What, what would I become? <laughs> I'm like, I want, I want someone to live with me. And then, you know, I'm thinking kind of, and then I go into spiritual mode and I'm like, I wonder what would happen to my discipleship if Jesus Christ of Nazareth lived with me for May of 2024. And I did, from May 1 to May 31, I did anything he asked 24 seven. Like he wakes me at three in the morning to pray or whatever, you name it. And I did whatever he told me to. What would transform about me? And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I have Christ through the spirit living in me. I just must be sleeping most of the time. So question for the room, what would your life be like if you spent the entire month of May? Just dream with me right now. Consciously saying, you know, Holy Spirit, I know you do extraordinary things, and I know I'm nowhere close to my spiritual capacity because my capacity is built on your capacity, Holy Spirit. And I've seen what you've done in church history and the scriptures. Here's my life, 31 days. Whatever and whenever you speak, I'll do it. I'm just gonna see what happens. What if we just... I'm not telling you to, but what would happen? Just dream with me for a second. And because you guys, we currently have Christ himself through the indwelling power of the spirit ready and willing to shape your life today. You have this. So let me say this. If you in your heart have settled on a negative view of your habits or a defeated view of your life patterns, like, I'm not that great at following Jesus. I mean, I'm okay. I squeeze in the Bible once in a while to make, make sure I don't feel so bad about not doing other things or whatever. But I'm just gonna struggle with my sin and sort of wrestle with doubt and fear the rest of my life. If that's you, listen, you are nowhere near your full spiritual potential. You're not done. The Holy Spirit can fill your life and change you. Uh, so this, so, so church, the dream I have and I think Stephen's life has for us as we move forward is that you'd say, I'm living with the Holy Spirit full contact. 2024, just to see what he does. So I don't know if you, do you long for this? Do you long for that kind of thing? I, 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 I do for myself, so I, I would invite you into the longing. So second thing from Stephen's life. Number two, he, he was a man of tremendous theological depth filled with the spirit, and he had theological depth. You don't just see, in Stephen's life, miracles. You don't just see miracles and signs. At the heart of it all, you see this remarkable like, understanding of what God is doing in scripture. Again, we're not gonna read the whole chapter seven, but Acts seven is Stephen's sermon. Read it on your own. It's like Acts seven, verse two through 51 or something. It's long. And it's a powerhouse. To sum it up, Stephen makes three basic theological arguments in this passage that still shock people today. It relates to Israel and the land and the temple and many people that are still fighting about these things today, sadly. And here's Stephen's sermon. Three points, basically. Number one, Stephen actually tells the rulers of Israel that they've missed the point of Israel. Remember, he's on trial, and he's like, I know you, you have me on trial, but you guys have missed the point of your purpose. You guys have missed it. Because the point of Israel was never just Israel, but to bless all nations. And then his second point, you can see he, he, he builds up to verse 48 with this point. Stephen tells the people in charge of the temple, they've misunderstood the point of the temple. 
So these religious leaders think, they've, think they have God in a building, but God has left the building. Jesus Christ is the new temple. He's the new location of God. And now whoever's in Christ has become the new temple with Jesus, the new place where God lives on earth in every nation. It's not just a building. And Stephen's just preaching this from the Old Testament, from the scriptures they believed in. He's telling them their beliefs are wrong. It's amazing. And then, verse, and then three point, the third point, Stephen tells Israel's law keepers that they've misunderstood the law. They think life's all about keeping law, but the law always pointed to the Messiah, who is Jesus, and they've missed Jesus. They actually killed Jesus. Therefore, they missed the point of the entire story they claim to be part of. And Stephen is unpacking this for them. And listen, here's, <laughs> Stephen is so persuasive and so clear and compelling in his sermon that they kill him. That's a persuasive sermon. That's an effect, like it generated a response, right? That's clear. He was so successful in showing Israel's leaders how they were off and how they've abused their power that their response was to use their power to kill him, to kill him. And now think with me about, the, there's an irony here. There's actually an irony. Stephen's a deacon, right? So while he's doing deacon stuff, like distributing food and running the organization of the church, and now he's preaching this awesome sermon, Stephen's doing his stuff. Do you remember what the 12 apostles are doing this whole time? At the beginning of chapter six, last week, they're like, we're gonna clear our schedule to do theology full time. So the apostles cleared their schedule to do theology to do word and prayer. And, and, but Stephen's actually the guy with the commute. He's the guy with no full-time pastor job. But look at him right now. He's like, let me break down a three-point theology lesson for the scholars. This is not a full-time apostle with 40 hours a week to prep a sermon. This is Stephen distributing food who has done the work to know God through the scriptures and now God is using him in a key moment to call people back to God. Hopefully this encourages you right now. Hopefully this encourages all of us. The guy with the commute is, is spotlighted right now, pushing the church forward, not the guys with the full-time pastor job. So let me say this uh, in this way on the screen. It'd be amazing if 2024 was both the year of the Holy Spirit and the year of profound theological growth in your life. This is why we're calling a whole church to our rule of life this year. Aaliyah mentioned it during announcements. These practices that come from Jesus that shape us in Jesus' way, like fasting, scripture, silence, solitude, and prayer. Why do we do those? So that we can allow the Holy Spirit and theological depth to permeate our lives and transform us more fully into people of love. So practical starting point, recommit to reading bread. I don't know how, you, I don't know how often you guys read bread. Uh, the journals that we've created. So here's just the month of April. It's a little pixelated. You can get the real one on the website or you can get a physical one at the table. That's the, those are the readings for the month of April. You guys, these scripture readings, uh, we didn't just pick them out of a hat. They come from the Revised Common Lectionary, which is the fruit of the work of many scholars and church leaders from Anglican, Catholic, all over the world. These scripture readings are arranged in such a way that as you read them together, you really experience how the whole story of scripture connects as you read it over two or three years. And so we created the physical bread journals to make it as easy as possible for you to absorb the whole story of scripture and pray through it. And we even released bread for kids, as you know, which my kids are devouring. My youngest, River, he's like, why don't, why don't I have, a, why don't I have a, a thing every day? Why is it only once a week? Because the kids' entries are weekly, um, just because we wanted to space it out for kids. But he's like, when's tomorrow? I'm like, tomorrow's next week. He's like, dang it. Because uh, he gets to draw his response to the scripture verse, which he loves. I'm kind of jealous of it. So even if bread isn't your thing, even if you're like, I don't like bread, that's fine. There are tons of apps and books and websites, PDFs, charts, podcasts for knowing what the Bible is doing. To start wrapping your, life, your mind around, okay, here's what the biblical text is trying to, to do and say. 
And honestly, I think these days you almost have to intentionally avoid reading a Bible plan to not read one. Like your notifications are telling you there's a Bible plan, you know? You have to like silence your phone to, on purpose to not know about Bible plans. It's like, what a time we live in, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and here's another way to grow in theological depth for everyone. Commit to revisiting all the Bible Project resources. Uh, how many of you have seen those animated videos on YouTube from the Bible Project? Did you know they have classes? The Bible Project actually has classes, not just videos. Uh, and, their, and the Bible Project podcast, it might be the best thing on the internet, in my opinion. So I love their mission, helping people experience the Bible as a unified story that leads to Jesus. You guys, this year, can you, can you read that? This year, can we just remind our hearts what that means? Experience the Bible as a unified story that leads to a person, this person we claim to be all about. So in that spirit, let's just come ready for the book of Acts for the rest of the year. Bring, maybe bring a physical Bible to church this year. Just to suggest, bring a physical Bible to, and a, something to write with, with your hand, uh, which is way more memorable than typing into a phone. It's been proven. Uh, make Sundays a conscious immersion moment, not just a passive spectator moment. Make it conscious immersion in the story of God with your, with your hand writing and your phys- physical page turning with your hand. The more you invest, the more you'll return in your life. These are just suggestions, zero shame if you're like, I actually am fully immersed as I am with my digital stuff. Great. But why not make this the year you grow in theological depth? And so as I'm saying this, you might be like, man, all this theology talk. But here's, here's, it's important to say this too. We don't learn scripture just for Bible trivia. Not at all. This is all about coming into close contact with God as a trinity of loving persons who's chosen to come to us through scriptures. This is not about information, it's about a person. The so what, you're like, so what? Well, the so what of the Bible is so that we are empowered to pray and obey the words of a triune God of love. And as we do, we grow in deeper intimacy with God and each other. God and each other get closer as we do this. That is the point of doing theology. We can have this misunderstanding in our hearts that theology, God, it's... God's boring. If you study God too much, you get bored or whatever. Maybe you're like, I, I'm just not theologically minded. I don't get nerdy. I'm not a theology nerd. It's not my personality. Listen, but if you're a Jesus person, that's fine. I get it. You don't have to learn Greek and Hebrew. Get it. But if you're a Jesus person, please don't think you're not theologically minded. Because when you do just a little bit of study, it will boggle your mind what is in this book and how good this God is, what he's revealed and what he has offered to us in this person, Jesus, who commissioned this Bible to be taken forward by the church. So let 2024 be the year we grow in both charismatic passion, like Holy Spirit stuff, signs and wonders and prayers and healing, Holy Spirit stuff, and theological depth as a community, both. Those things rarely go together, in my experience, right? Because often people who are all about the Holy Spirit, they chase after charismatic fire. They're often like, oh, we don't need to go deep in theology because that'll just make you prideful and dry. And then, and then often people who are super into theology and they, they study the Greek and Hebrew and they're into all the church history, they're the people that usually get freaked out when the Holy Spirit shows up, right? And so there's like this separation, but when those two things come together in an individual and in a church, something remarkable happens. Stephen happens. So let this be the year of both. Turn both up to 11, you know? (laughs) The year of the Holy Spirit and theological depth. Just resolve in our hearts. This summer, maybe this is you. This summer, I'm gonna find better answers for my questions I've always had. So I'm gonna take a Bible Project classroom course. I'm just gonna do it. 
Or I'm just going to own the book of Romans and read a couple commentaries for myself this summer. Or I'm going to pray all 31 Proverbs all 31 days of May. I'm just going to pray all 31 Proverbs. Or maybe you're like, I actually want to be mentored. I don't want to do this alone. I'm a horrible procrastinator. So I want to be formally mentored in the scriptures. So I think I'm just going to enroll for a night class at Pacific Theological Seminary, which is 18-minute drive from here in Miramar, because I just want a better grasp on what the, the narrative of the Bible is actually doing. And I want a mentor who's grading my papers for like four months on it, you know? And so whatever that looks like for you, this is something I personally had to do for my own spiritual and emotional health in my 20s and 30s. I grew up in a church culture that held really tightly to some niche secondary views. Uh, views about creation that don't appear in church history and don't align with science. Uh, I grew up in a church culture where there were views about the end times and the rapture that the vast majority of Christians globally don't share. I'm like, why are we unique in this one little view? Or views about sex and gender that simply put benefited men and demeaned women. And one of the biggest elephants in the room that I grew up with was how my church basically taught a Republican Jesus. See the elephant Republican thing that I just did? Elephant in the room. <laughs> Turns out Jesus is not on the right left American political spectrum after all. But I didn't know how to separate that. I needed to be trained. I needed to submit to an environment of in integrity, theological integrity. And all this was leading me toward a faith crisis, call it deconstruction, call it existential doubt, whatever you want to call it. I desired to know and love God revealed in Jesus, and I also knew I wasn't going to get to him by staying in my own echo chamber. So I had to find a community, a seminary, mentors, elders who I could submit to, and I gave them permission to tell me when my reactionary deconstruction attitude was unchristlike. I gave them permission to tell me that because I respected them enough to, to actually respond. I respected them enough to change when they encouraged me to change, all while I'm reading for the sake of loving people and loving God. This is the point of theological depth. It's not just to know Bible trivia or to be in the right tribe. It's to know the real God. It's to know the real God, truly, and to know the real me, the real me who God has made. That's in the Bible too. And to know the family of God and to let the family know the real me. That's the point. As I grow in humility and my ability to love God and other people, and the only way that could happen for me is if I got off Twitter and put down the deconstruction podcast echo chamber and immerse myself in flesh and blood, real life community alongside millions of other people chasing intimacy with the trinity of loving persons through the text. It's the only way. And you guys, when you wake up to that purpose, you suddenly have this desire, a true desire for theological depth empowered by the Spirit for the purpose of loving, loving God and others. This is what we're talking about. So coming to the end of this second point, if whatever that looks for you, let's resolve it. Can you resolve in your heart? Can we all resolve in our hearts? This is the year of theological depth for me for the sake of love. Like I used to joke with people, I used to joke with people in our church. I suggest we even have theological dating standards. <laughs> so like side note, at, at last week's basics class, someone asked the dating question because we have texting questions. Someone texted, does Park Hill have a stance on dating? Like, do we have like a dating guide, like church dating guidance? And the answer is no. Uh, <clears throat> dating, obviously, as we know it, was basically invented by your grandparents' generation. It's super new, so the Bible isn't interested in the topic. But I like to say, I like to say this, I jokingly say, as a part of the dating requirements of the church, we should have like a scale of theological depth. Like, okay, that guy's incredible, successful, he takes care of himself, but he's only a two at theological depth, so I'm gonna have to swipe left or whatever. I just, I say that, to say, we need some categories for this. We need a framework for thinking of this. I, I think that's true. And obviously the dating thing's a joke, but third, last thing from Stephen's life. Last thing, he had this just compelling and difficult but beautiful blend of courage with humility. Both. Can, can we just say, can we say the word both together? One, two, three. Both. 
that is a rare combo. There are plenty of keyboard warriors and comment section invaders. And we can find, and, you know, there, we can find plenty of courageous people online who are really just jerks. And you can find plenty of seemingly humble people who actually don't celebrate the reality of God, who don't stand for God at the appropriate time. So both, both. Stephen is a model of this. So let's start with courage. <laughs> Look at the end of Stephen's life. The end of this story is the end of his life. He actually dies. He dies at the end of this chapter. First guy to die for the gospel in Acts. He stops like this. He, he ends like this. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. Uncircumcised is a bad thing for a Jewish in a Jewish mind. It's like you don't, you don't actually belong the way you think you do. You're not part of what God is doing in the world. Uh, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you've betrayed and murdered him, you who've received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. And so <clears throat> think of the most influential voices in your society. How much courage would it take to stand before those authoritative voices in your culture and rebuke them. Incredible amount of courage to stand there at the time you're called to stand there and to say the reality that you know is real in the name of Jesus. We live in a time when it can be very difficult to live with courage to humbly speak truth because everybody wants to be liked. No one wants to be canceled. So here's Stephen modeling the Christ-like way to speak truthfully about sin and doing it completely humbly. Not as a keyboard warrior. What's the problem <laughs> with a comment section truth teller? Zero relationship, zero community, zero responsibility to them as a person other than your 18 words that you're texting in their YouTube comment section. That is not courageous. But so Stephen doesn't do a keyboard warrior. He does it as a fellow Jewish citizen standing in person on trial for his life with skin in the game and love for his leaders. We have to have a vision for this. This means growing as a culture of trust in our communities where we both freely confess sin and joyfully call each other out of sin, both. We have to have a vision for this. And yeah, I get that. Inviting someone to turn from sin, have you ever done that? Have you ever like come to someone inviting them to turn from sin? That's not a sexy thing to do. It feels like confrontation, right? Doesn't feel sexy. Who here feels super great about confronting sin? It's just like your thing, that's your wheelhouse. That's like, you, you're very, you're used to it. It's a muscle you've worked out, you're used to it. I'm suspicious of you, <laughs> if that's true. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, we have to have a heart and willingness for this. There has to be a heart and willingness. There has to be an expectation that in communities of trust, open conversation about the reality of sin in the camp is expected. Because it's not the church of Jesus and the church of all our opinions. It's got to be all him. Jesus is Lord of all. And again, third time, I want to say this very repeatedly. I sound redundant now. Stephen is not just a sin-confronting keyboard warrior or call-out culture guy. He's humbly confronting sin in his own Jewish brothers, and it cost him his life. It will cost no one their life to post a disagreement online. It cost Stephen his life. So as, as the family of Jesus, we have to remember that the Christian life is about self-denial, not self-fulfillment. The Christian goal, the way Jesus ended his life was crucified as a political figure in front of everyone, 
Do you realize we follow a man all the way through. If you're a Jesus follower, you follow him all the way through, which means you follow him as a crucified political figure in front of the entire state he was part of. So if our number one goal is to be liked by everyone, we're in the wrong faith. So let's make this the year we grow in the Holy Spirit and in theological depth and courage where we're willing to have those hard conversations within our community to call each other higher toward Jesus. So here's the way, if you're like, what does that even look like? Here's a way it can go. If you're a Jesus follower and you're willingly cultivating sin in your life, someone needs to come in on that. Like for real, to step into that with you. Why? A big reason is because people should not be disillusioned by the church because of your character. People outside the church can disagree with our doctrines, that's fine. They can dislike our liturgy, that's 100% great. But they'd better not be disillusioned by our character. And as we do this, as we call each other to the truth, listen, our truthful stances do not matter without a humble posture. Again, here's the humility piece. Here it is, Stephen, after he pokes a hornet's nest, well, how, how, does, how, does, he, how does he respond? So they, they, they come to kill him, and he's like, Lord, forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. What sin? The sin of throwing rocks at him until he bleeds to death. He's like, Lord, don't hold this against them. Forgive them of this. Welcome them in. Welcome them in. Save them. How, much of, how many of us love our enemies and our cancelers <laughs> like that? Some people love fighting to the bitter end and arguing to the bitter end, but here's a guy who embraces the conflict with conviction and courage, but is willing out of total humility and grace to lay his life down on the other side of things. This is what our culture needs. It's this both of courage and deep humility that leads us to bleeding heart love for our enemies. More than ever, we need that at the same time, especially in a year of heightened political tension, like we see. And after all said and done, as Stephen is dying, as his enemies are killing him, I, I think it's amazing that we see Jesus give, giving Stephen a standing ovation. Uh, here it is, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, Looked, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is the only place in the Bible where we see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Everywhere else, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. But here he's standing as Stephen finishes his life well. It's like Jesus is saying, Man, that is good. That is how I did it. I relied on the Holy Spirit too. I understood the scriptures. I spoke truth with conviction and I died in humility asking the Father to forgive all my killers. And Stephen, you've modeled your life after me. Well done, man. Standing, well done. You guys, this is an amazing moment to be alive. This year, people are lonely. They've always been lonely, but we know so many people now because we're so interconnected. We see loneliness. People feel like life is passing them by, longing for family. People call online communities their family when there's, they've never been embodied in the same room. People are looking for a framework for how to make sense of suffering and difficult circumstance and how they fit into the meaning of life. And I'm like, man, as God's family, we have the answer for all that. Like, we have all that. We have meaning, belonging, family, peace through suffering. The gospel brings all of it. It's what Jesus called life to the full, and he's applauding Stephen living it out right now. We have what Stephen has. We have that for the taking. The opportunity we have is to step into it, 
to resolve in our hearts to step into life in the spirit. Communion with God daily. Every day we're living with this God who wants to transform us. And he does so through the scriptures. So we take up and read. And then as we step out with the scriptures and with the spirit in our hearts, we actually courageously and humbly point the way without apology for people to experience the same meaning of life. So, so filled with the Holy Spirit, theological growth and depth, courage and humility to speak the truth. This is this is. The way, this is what Stephen shows us. It's what Jesus showed us. So the crucial question as we come to communion, um, it's not a question about your circumstances, like what are you gonna do about when the money's tight or, or how are you gonna fix things outside of you? The crucial question for your life is, will you become more like Jesus this year in this way? Will you become more of a person of love by the power of the Spirit and seeking Jesus in Scripture and then living it out courageously when it's unpopular but, but not doing so as a jerk but as this invitation of love because when you're poked, you dispense humility like you're made of grace. So whatever's happening to you, the circumstances around you, the most important thing by far is what's happening in you. It's so clear that what had been happening in Stephen leading up to this, the day of his death was all of these profound things. And Jesus offers you himself in the same way. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna come and ask. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever desires the Holy Spirit, let him ask. The Father loves giving the Holy Spirit to those who ask. James chapter one says the same thing in a different way. Let whoever lacks wisdom, how many of you, don't show your hands, lack wisdom? You'd like more wisdom for how to do this stuff. Yeah, whoever lacks wisdom, let him ask because God is a God who loves giving wisdom freely without partiality. He loves it. He loves wisdom. He loves it. Let him do this for you today. And what that looks like is during the next song, before we come to the table, there'll be people up front on the right and left who will pray for you. And you just say, I need wisdom, or I want the power of the Spirit. I want more of his presence in my life. It is a good thing to simply pray more, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. I don't know what needs to change really. Maybe you don't know what needs to change. Maybe it's not about changing right now. It's just about hunger. I'm hungry for you, God, to take more territory in my life because I know it'll be good even though I don't know what it is. More, Lord. So can we come with a hungry prayer of more? Up front on my right and left, there'll be people who just pray the power of God fills your life. And then Aaliyah, one of our pastors, she's gonna lead us in the table eating and drinking after that to finish. But let's just come right now. The Holy Spirit wants to take more root in your life, fill you with himself.
There's still going to be people who are ready to pray on either side. So if you still want to receive prayer, you have not missed your moment. Um, but we're going to go go to the tables, get the bread in the cup, and then bring it back to your seat, and we're going to take it all together.
We were just talking about the story of Stephen for the last hour. And I just, I want to read this last part, the way that Stephen ended his life. When Stephen was being persecuted, he said, look, he said, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at him at the top of their voices. And they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell to his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. See, Stephen was emulating Jesus. He was able to see the beauty of Jesus and the Savior that we serve, the one who says, do this in remembrance in me. We take the bread and the cup every week and we remember the broken body and the blood of our Savior. And he stood for Stephen. We serve a humble and lowly king who is willing to give us himself fully. So when we do this, we remember that we were given not just his death, but also his resurrection. And we get to follow in Stephen's footsteps when we we enter into heaven. This is the goal. We would know our Savior deeply and we would look like him. So let's take the body. Remember that this is Jesus' body broken for us. And then we take the cup together, we remember, we just sang about it, worshiping Jesus. Washed as white as snow by a savior who would pour out his blood for us. Let's take the cup. So Father, we worship you, we praise you, we ask that we wouldn't settle. We wouldn't settle for just mundane life, but we would know you deeply and we would look like Stephen, we would look like you, Jesus. Day in and day out, would you help us to carry this truth that we've been given your death and resurrection? Pray that that would shape everything that we do. Thank you for you. Amen. We're going to close our time out today by singing the doxology together. And we do this just to kind of orient our hearts towards the Father as we head into our week. So let's sing it together, Park Hill. Praise God from blessings flow. Now, Park Hill, as you go out into your week, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you. Happy Sunday.